My name is Asia Matolieva, and I'm really happy to welcome you on Sharing Security Forum 2020, very unusual year and very unusual moment to uh, discuss future and current security threats. It's a very exciting panel this morning. Uh, this morning, you're going to be able to uh, see the recordings later on social media. This afternoon, we are continuing with more discussions on current and ongoing invisible threats. But before the next panel, there is uh, an expert workshop uh, in which I have the, the pleasure to present a research that I recently finished, a policy paper devo devoted to border restrictions in Europe and the new border regimes that we are experiencing due to the pandemic. I would like to also introduce Cameron Ashraf, uh, assistant professor from Central European University, who is going to be a discussant uh, for this session. And I would like to encourage you to ask your questions and please leave your comments. Uh, we are going to be able to discuss them later after the presentation. Uh, and I hope it's going to be interesting for you and you're also going to be able to reflect on your knowledge and experiences and contribute to this expert workshop. I would like to start uh, with first sharing my screen so you're going to be able to follow the key arguments of, um, of the paper. Okay, almost there. Right. I hope that everybody is able to see uh, the, the presentation already. Border control um, has been introduced in many European countries, uh, as you know, in the first part of uh, 2020 as an emergency policy response to the pandemic. Later on, countries in Europe started reopening and switching to different uh, variations or, or, or various combinations of uh, border restrictions um, with testing and quarantine rules. However, the very unsynchronized process of, um, of this, uh, these measures has led to to confusion, to probably lack of effectiveness of these measures. And this is um, basically the topic of, of the paper. The question I'm trying to um, answer in this, in this paper is, are border restrictions an effective measure to tackle the pandemic in case of ongoing and future outbreaks? Unfortunately, we don't have such a rich experience or probably fortunately, it's, um, it's something that we are living through right now and politicians have the challenge to come up with, with quick solutions. What we know from previous um, experiences of like epidemics like Ebola or, um, or like local basically uh, dissemination of, of, uh, of COVID like the case of China in, in January and February Border restrictions have only modest effect on the trajectory of the epidemic. And also they are very ineffective when it comes to, for example, distributing aid or uh, letting people travel between countries uh, to, to support, for example, medical teams if in neighboring countries or so. If we look at the international health regulations, there are very clear rules what we should do in, uh, in this situation of COVID-19 when we, when we talk about the entry points of the countries. These are detection of, of the travelers who might potentially be ill, uh, also to, to have interview with them reporting the, the alerts of ill travelers and also to follow the steps of isolation and initial case management. However, the biggest problem that a lot of European countries have witnessed is lack of capacity. Not every country could basically follow these steps. And this is why politicians decided that it's a better solution to impose um, travel restrictions and uh, border closures in the spring of 2020. The fundamental, the more fundamental problem than the, the practical ones, the lack of capacity, is that border restrictions across Europe um, oppose the need for greater international cooperation on disease control when we talk about addressing pandemic. 
When Bebbing doesn't have borders, we probably uh, have heard this many times during the past months. And in, on the contrary, the, the, the measures we have been implementing oppose this idea for greater international cooperation. And in addition, uh, when we talk about the values of the European Union, uh, border restrictions limit the freedom of movement of European citizens. So what I can uh, probably uh, stress as a, as a key argument of, of this paper is that We've ended up um, emphasizing and like, um, let's say, developing policies based on national individualism in Europe, not on international cooperation. Uh, why and how we ended up having, having this uh, type of approach? On the first place, politicians have chosen to frame in the beginning COVID as a national security threat. By having this framing, um, as you can imagine, thinking of, about territory, about uh, protecting the nation, borders and border regimes play a very significant role. Logically, the, the policy response was um, basically to proceed with, with this type of, of, of approach. On the second place, the relationship between border control and health security is also something that we shouldn't underestimate. The great variation or inequality between healthcare systems in different countries didn't allow uh, politicians to make the decision to let the borders stay open. If we have limited capacity in uh, of like the, the, the healthcare system in country A, we cannot expect that government would take a decision that would basically make the healthcare system uh, collapse. And this was the key argument in the policy making process. In this sense, like even if it probably uh, sounds like a, like a, a very uh, serious criticism, but the, the logic behind the decision making was driven by national, national individualism, um, which means that international cooperation um, was something that countries didn't think in the very beginning, although it was clear that it is not an issue that only one country in Europe is, um, is facing. So this relationship between border control and health security uh, was also, um, let's say, uh, seen as um, like the, the, the approach to, to it was uh, through flattering the curve policy. The attempt to flatten the curve uh, through um, closing the borders was exactly to um, re-emphasize this relationship between border control and health security by telling citizens, if we close borders, we will be able to protect the, the healthcare system and the capacity of the state to provide uh, healthcare to its citizens. As I mentioned, this poses the idea of cooperation, not only internationally, but also regionally. We could see that borders remain closed um, in, in like regions where the threat wasn't that significant in the very beginning, or let's say the, the spring and the early summer of 2020. Moreover, the lack of consistency and cooperation in the implementation of, of these measures across the EU um, led to very unsynchronized border regimes. And therefore we had zones of exclusion that differed from um, one to another. Many countries decided to reopen borders during the summer, not based on uh, some like in-depth uh, threat assessments done by local governments, but mainly driven by political and economic interests. Just take as an example, the touristic sector. Neighboring countries decided to reopen uh, borders or to reestablish some, um, some rules based on, on the fact that they have a large exchange of tourism and they expected a bigger flow of, of, uh, of people to cross the borders during the summer months. Uh, this basically made some European citizens to be in, in a disadvantaged position, whereas other citizens uh, were given the privilege to, uh, to experience this uh, freedom of movement in times when um, 
we, we have this unsynchronized border regimes. As you know, many countries, um, and I'm going to discuss a couple of them in, in the next slides, they decided to implement the so-called traffic light system, also recommended by the European Commission. And what we can see now is that many and many countries, more and more countries decide to switch to this system. Um, this system basically distinguishes between countries with high and low level uh, risks. And the logic behind this is to attempt not to block everyone, but only certain populations based on the information about number of COVID cases in a given country. Even we decide to, uh, to leave the borders open, and this was uh, the, the, the main discussion during uh, the, the past months, how can we replace uh, this um, measure considered by governments as uh, something that could be a short-term response. We saw that countries switched to different regimes of implementing quarantine and testing rules. Right now, we can see that um, European states continue to, to um, rely on this individualistic approach, uh, how, although there is like recommendation by the European Commission uh, for, uh, let's say, synchronizing this process and, and the rules that we are, uh, we are implementing. We, can, we, we should say that even we replace uh, border closures with, uh, with these uh, rules, there are certain limitations, which means that there is no zero risk measure. There is no zero risk policy we can apply in order to uh, regulate freedom of, 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 of movement. When it comes to quarantine, um, basically the state has very limited capacity to follow the implementation of, of the quarantine rules and to a large degree, it's individual's responsibility to follow and comply with the rules. When it comes to testing, you know that there, is a lot of, there are a lot of criticisms already. One of them is that even though uh, we, we get tested at the entry point of a certain country, um, we can always get infected and then uh, bring uh, the, 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 the virus back to a low uh, risk country we come from. And this is basically the, the, the last point that I'm making here is that traveling from a low risk country to a high risk country doesn't necessarily mean that uh, we, we, we don't uh, bring the, the virus and contribute to the transmission. And just to conclude, once again, uh, the, the solutions uh, that appear across countries are imperfect and they always have certain percentage of risk. In the paper, I'm looking at this, the case of the Central European uh, countries and um, one interesting argument that was made in one of the previous panel, panels that uh, basically, even though we talk about the, the Visegrad uh, format, or Central Europe as a region, we can see a lot of differences when it comes to security, when it comes to threat responses, and COVID-19 is the perfect example for this. Although there is certain, um, let's say, agreement between countries in, in the region to basically facilitate freedom of movement during these um, tough months, we can still say that there are great differences between, uh, between some of the countries in the region when it comes to the implementation of, of uh, the measures. Czech Republic was one of the first countries in Europe to implement the so-called traffic light system. Uh, it was one of the brightest examples during the spring uh, how the country was addressing the pandemic. However, you've probably seen the, the news and one of the criticisms um, towards uh, like the government and the, the public health authorities is that the loose social distancing and abandoning the compulsory mask wearing uh, during the, 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 the past weeks basically led to the crisis Czech Republic is experiencing now when it comes to outbreak of COVID. On the other hand, we could see in the time of reopening of the borders that um, Austria came up with like um, a very quick solution to basically test arrivals at, at uh, the airport in Vienna. 
um, and also um, another approach was not to re restrict arrivals from certain countries but certain regions approach adopted by other states uh, currently in Europe. Uh, Slovakia also differs um, very much, I would say, in terms of, uh, for example, uh, taking uh, the, the, the situation right now, taking the opportunity to test the entire population. And also before uh, this uh, decision to uh, distribute very detailed quarantine rules for everybody who is arriving from either low or, um, or high risk country. And finally, uh, Hungary has uh, is this interesting example. In the moment when most countries, or I would say all the countries in, in the European Union decided to reopen and uh, basically to be very careful on 1st of September uh, in terms of decision, decision making whether to re-implement this, uh, uh, this border restrictions again that we, uh, we saw in the spring, Hungary decided to without uh, like informing citizens, like passengers who were traveling to the country, without informing the European Commission that they also they want to reinforce these tough border restrictions. And I'm having this uh, quote on the slide. It's uh, from, I think, a spokesperson of the, the, the Prime Minister of Hungary saying, Hungary is green, every other country in the world is red. This is the approach that Hungary took in the beginning of uh, September without even considering uh, the options for, um, let's say, more diverse approach towards uh, people entering its territory. To conclude, um, the main recommendation I can, um, I, 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 I do in this, in this paper is uh, that closing borders shall be the option, the least preferred one by policymaker. Uh, due to the very negative consequences for the freedom of movement, individuals, goods, and services. Of course, we can discuss uh, the, um, the, the role of the state uh, in, uh, in the process of, of dealing uh, with the current outbreak, and also of the European Union as a supranational securitizing actor. But uh, the main takeaway is that we should emphasize and we have to focus on the other measures that would prevent us from implementing border restrictions. I'm going to stop here. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Azia, for that very interesting paper. Um, I'm Cameron Ashraf. I'm a professor at Central European University, and um, I'm also co-founder of Access Now, which is a very large uh, international human rights and technology organization. And I'll be discussing uh, uh, Azia's paper a little bit here. Today, first of all, I think it's, it's very interesting, very provocative, um, and I'll be taking a more theoretical approach. And if you don't mind, I don't have slides, but I'll be reading uh, off a Word document here. So you'll see me as a talking head. I apologize for that. But, uh, you know, it's good to mix it up a little bit with these online things. We've had, you know, we've been so slide based. Let's have some talking heads here. But anyway, I'll get on to uh, what I have to say. And again, as I mentioned, um, I am taking more of a theoretical approach. So Ozzy's paper is a succinct contribution to literature that questions this explicit territorial approach to combating the pandemic. Uh, she rightly emphasizes that the approach states have taken to protect against the coronavirus, uh, she, she rightly emphasizes the approach states have taken to protect against the coronavirus and frames this approach against a global scientific consensus, right? As she was discussing earlier, you know, the research seems to show that this approach actually doesn't necessarily work. States, but the thing is, is that states are territorial entities um, and their, their history and reason for being in large part are based on their claims to this exclusive sovereign power over some part of the earth's surface, right? This is a very seductive idea, right? It makes sense. Um, scholars, think tanks, journalists, and others have also really focused deeply on making the territorial state, this sort of territorial logic, the de facto source of legitimate power and authority. They've done such a good job that regardless of how much power you actually have, influence you actually have, unless you have a chunk of territory that everybody else agrees upon that you have, you have no vote at the United Nations, right? So this has become a very, very, very uh, convincing idea. 
lots of people are, have bought it into it, right? This logic works at multiple scales, but it's just actually one approach amongst many. In her paper, Asya argues that these Central European states have taken steps to, which reinforce this national individualism, which would of course be predicated on that essential aspect of the territorial state, right? That we are different, we are unique, we have our own traditions and history informing our decisions and visions of how the world should operate, et cetera. You go to any country, you'll see it. Statues that commemorate how unique we are, national anthems, which talk about how special we are. Uh, the landscape will be dotted with monuments, you know, commemorating various events that happened there, you know, all from this perspective of the self and other. So from here, you can see a broader theme in her paper, the challenge of moving beyond this exceptionalism and individualism and even national egocentrism upon which ethnically homogenous nation states actually must be built towards a new model of engaging with these with critical issues like coronavirus, uh, rather than performing sovereignty theater, better suited to a different century and an approach that, which lacks really imagination and creativity, right? So the approaches in which that Ozzy's talked about here, in, to my mind, really strike me as a sovereignty theater that, that reinforces very outdated uh, ways of thinking uh, and simply also displays a real lack of creativity, imagination, and courage at the state level. Her policy positions argue for, in essence, subsuming sovereignty theater under regionally relevant and coordinated health measures to synchronize responses and thereby offer the best approach to limit the ongoing damage of the pandemic. As she's outlined in her paper, each state is taking a different approach, which, which doesn't align. And I'll quote her here. The logic of sovereignty also provides space for stricter or looser restrictions justified by political or economic interests rather than adequate threat assessments. And as she outlines, these are based on tourism, economic ties, diplomacy. Uh, I, think, I, think Hungary, I think Hungary had a case, excuse me, sorry, something dropped. I think Hungary had a case uh, where they were allowing some sports fans to come in. So we could even say, you know, it's, it's tourism, economics, and sports as well. In other words, Asia argues for a subordination of traditional sovereignty under health guidelines, presumably under some sort of a regional interstate health authority or something, which would coordinate these synchronized responses. While her policy recommendations and approaches may not be taken up by states, it is really important that Asia is arguing for a move beyond what the geopolitical scholar John Agnew calls the territorial trap. And in, in, in his theory, namely, this is the conflation of states with fixed territory, this idea of a domestic and foreign duality or polarity, and the state as a container of society, right? These are territory traps and even how we think, I mean, you know, our passports carry that with us wherever we go. I say I'm an American. Um, and there's a whole host of assumptions that come up around that, right? Policy interventions and policy making, academic research and journalism can all benefit from her reflections on the ways in which our geographical vision of the world is contributing to pandemic responses, which have thus far exacerbated the disease rather than actually contributed meaningfully to solutions. Uh, precisely because the coronavirus transcends borders, um, it asks of us to consider thinking beyond and above borders which have dominated public discourse and policy. It requires unique and creative ways to bring, which bring to bear the wisdom of the, the various you know, ethno-national groups uh, involved in the pandemic, rather than resorting to outdated, unrealistic visions of the territorial state better suited to you know, 1500, 1600s, 19th century. Ozzy's paper and policy proposals really help us move towards new geographical imaginations, which are uh, sorely, uh, which are sorely uh, needed. Sorry, uh, my microphone was rubbing against my shirt there. Um, so to that end, I have a number of questions that I would like to pose to Asia. Maybe we can so we can have a bit of a discussion. And I really, as she mentioned earlier, I encourage you all to uh, post comments and uh, questions for us as well, for her. Uh, but unless Asia has a response to, my, to what I've said, uh, I can go ahead and ask some questions. So let me see if she has a response. Thank you, Cameron, for uh, your words. And I actually, I would like to encourage our viewers uh, to also um, not only ask questions, but if they have contributions and comments, because I think that's a topic that affects our our lives. Everybody uh, has been affected by by the new uh, 
uh, the new policies that have been implemented in, in the recent months, everybody has been feeling like in, in an experiment when it comes to uh, like traveling and like being restricted in terms of uh, in, 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 in terms of uh, freedom of movement and in the way we, we used to live be, before 2020. And um, just a, a quick comment to, uh, to your comment and what you said. I, indeed, I, I do argue that uh, territory is not the, 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 the primary uh, or let's say the starting point. It shouldn't be the starting point of decision making to the extent that um, if we take, for example, the quarantine rules, this was also a way of like uh, longer distance policing, right? Although you don't uh, check people at the entry point of a certain country, you do have mechanisms to uh, whether restrict or to navigate and control to a certain extent the, the freedom, the, the movement of people for the sake of like uh, preventing public health. In this sense, I would say that um, we have to reconceptualize the idea of borders. Right, so borders are not necessarily the physical uh, spots of entering a country, but they can also appear in, in uh, different bureaucratic rules that we have been implementing. Uh, in this sense, I totally um, agree with, 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 with what you said. And uh, although the state has the primary um, uh, sovereignty when it comes to territory, and this is always um, something we, we, we should consider. Uh, this monopoly over territory uh, might be also, uh, let's say, a limitation in terms of uh, if politicians don't have the imagination to reconceptualize these borders, it can be a limiting, let's say, experience. Yeah, thank you. Exactly. I mean, I, I definitely agree. Agree with you. And also the populations and scholars and everything else that informs, um, you know, the state apparatus uh, lacks a sort of imagination because it's also very scary. We have also invested a lot of personal identities in the idea of the territorial state. You know, I'm Hungarian. I'm you know Chinese, whatever it might be. Um, and this is a very difficult thing because it also has a lot of resonance. So if it's okay with you, maybe I'll put some, ask you some questions. Um, I think it would be very interesting for our viewers to, to hear your thoughts. Um, and so the first question I have is that your policy recommendations were very thoughtful. And I made, definitely made an assumption in my comments about how you envision your recommendations being en enacted. So could you elaborate a bit on some of your recommendations and how you would actually see them being implemented regionally like what would sort of some of the structures perhaps be that might be erected around um, these your recommendations or how might it happen on the ground what would it take for it to happen uh, you're muted uh, yep sorry uh, so i just want to ask how do you use the word regionally here whether we talk about the european union as Good a region question. or we talk about different regions within the european union I would leave that up to you, actually, uh, on how okay, you would so define it. That's that's a very um, that that's important uh, clarification because I argue in this paper is that we we do need more coordination exactly uh, across the European countries, uh, but we also have experience of um, let's say regionalization of uh, of the measures and the way uh, COVID has been. Um, seen as a threat, which means that in terms of threat definition, we certainly have seen different regions within, within, within the European Union. Well, one thing I can say is that whether borders remain open, whether we talk about the ongoing outbreak or, or future outbreaks, it depends on a on couple of things. First, we need like a very detailed assessment of the public health uh, capabilities in, in, in a given country, the government actions and the history of these actions in the, the recent uh, months, and also the behavior of the citizens in this country. Only having these three components uh, will give you, will give us the, the full picture of like one country or let's say group of countries, whether they can synchronize uh, their, uh, their measures and whether they can 
uh, work towards uh, the idea of letting people move freely, uh, but having synchronized uh, policies across the countries. Because let me put it this way, if um, I decide to travel from, uh, let's say, um, Hungary or, or Poland or other country in the region to uh, Czech Republic, and there is like a great um, mismatch between the measures implemented within the countries, this um, this will be very inefficient uh, in terms of like addressing the pandemic. Because at the end of the day, we shouldn't forget what is the issue that we are trying to address. What is the, the real problem? And the real problem is, is an invisible threat by nature. And in this sense, by imposing uh, like um, territorial restrictions doesn't necessarily address the problem. It gives people probably some sense of security and like in, in moments when the state cannot do much, let's say, because uh, many, many, many governments uh, react in state of confusion and overreact. Uh, so the, the, what they can do is to show that the state is present through imposing um, border restrictions. When we talk about the recommendations, uh, I would uh, say that the European Commission came up with, uh, with similar recommendations in the beginning of September, which means that we have to um, work um, on more standard, st standard, standardized uh, a way of, um, let's say, doing testing, whether we do testing, what test do we require? Is it like 72 hours before an individual enters a given country? Or is it at the entry point of, of the state? Then uh, in terms of quarantine rules, we know that we do have all this great variety of like choices and like countries implementing quarantine rules differently. So we do need synchronization there. and also exchange of information between member states. Because so far, what we can see is that, especially during the summer, is that many countries, um, let's say, uh, for the sake of like preventing tourism, preventing the economy, they were like more willing to stick to loser rules or to uh, provide information not necessary in a comprehensive manner to other countries. And therefore, this coordination uh, that we could work for during the summer, uh, for me, didn't happen. So we missed the moment, but we can do this in, in the next uh, months. Just a, a, like a, a very short note on Central Europe. As I said, countries in the region are trying their best to stay open uh, and to basically create rules within the, the, the Visegrad 4 or like the Central European uh, region. Um, however, the differences I listed in, in, in the paper show that there are still great variations that might lead to confusions in terms of threat assessment and also the implementation of the adopted policies. Yeah, that's, you know, that you know, some of the stuff that you said that reminded me of the concept of, of where I borrowed the phrase sovereignty theater from the concept of security theater that uh, oftentimes states actually don't know how to respond to security threats, but what's important is that they look like they're responding. Um, so you have, you know, very serious people in uniforms talking, you know, or you have various things erected around, or uh, you might, you know, you, you might not have any idea about terrorist threats, for example, at a Christmas market, but you just put a bunch of military police around so people feel safer. Um, so I really think that that's a very, uh, uh, great point that you were making. And actually all your comments lead me to where I was really wanted to go. Um, so two parts for me is what do you see as the role for the state and borders in a pandemic? I certainly, I think there is a role. Um, and it seems like you think that as well. And are there any best practices that you're aware of? Has anything really stood out to you either you know, in Europe or around the world that could really serve as a model? And actually I do see that there's a couple questions um, but in the chat, but anyway, but whichever ones you want to take. Yeah, I think I, I, I just, uh, this is a good continuation of, of uh, our uh, conversation already about uh, sovereignty and then um, I will be happy to respond to the questions in the chat. But you know, like sovereignty is there and I think that we can see more sovereignty than anything else right now when, when states basically take the, 
uh, the lead in, in deciding to to show the, the the borders, right? To show that we belong here. This is this is our nation. This is our state, and this is how we protect it from uh, from the pandemic. Um, but this sovereignty can be used for the sake of cooperating with with other countries because. Um, especially when we think of the European Union as, as a whole, right? So the idea of this, uh, of this union is to, uh, we talked about uh, solidarity in the, the, the previous panel uh, of the forum. So to express this, um, this solidarity, we can use the concept of, of sovereignty. Sovereignty shouldn't be necessarily something limiting when it comes to addressing the pandemic. Sovereignty can be also a facilitating concept uh, or let's say bridging concept uh, and like um, creating a link with, with other countries, whether it's going to be at uh, the level of the region or um, the EU as a whole. And in this sense, I think that um, we're probably going to talk a bit more about um, the let's say the implication, implications and the political rhetoric that ha has been benefiting from, uh, from this, but sovereignty shouldn't be uh, something uh, adopted by nationalistic rhetoric or, or, or like populist rhetoric for the sake of like uh, uh, saying, okay, to, to build this anti-globalization narratives, right? Uh, so I would use I would uh, use it, and uh, I think it's um, it, it makes sense to to think of sovereignty in the sense of of, of a group of countries, not uh, from the perspective of individual nationalism. I'm just having a look at the chat because uh, there are a couple of really interesting questions, and one of them is um, whether I think that some countries close borders with the preference of other factors uh, except COVID-19 and uh, to what extent this is logical. As I mentioned in, in, uh, in the presentation and you can also read it in the paper, in my view and from what I, I, I've researched during the past months, some countries made this decision based not on public health assessment or public health threat assessment, but they, they made this decision based on economic or political, um, let's say, priorities. Uh, why I'm saying this because uh, we really couldn't see well-developed and comprehensive threat assessments during the past months developed by national governments. Instead, we could see um, measures implemented and presented as preventive measures. Uh, I'm, I'm bringing uh, again the, the example of Hungary uh, that in the beginning of September has a very, very limited number of cases, right, of, of, of uh, positive cases of COVID-19. However, Hungary was the country that implemented the toughest border restrictions after the, the period of reopening during the summer. In this sense, um, I, I would say, and of course, like the, the political rhetoric was also in light with, with, with this idea that Hungary is safe, the rest of the world is unsafe. Nobody is welcome because we perceive you as a threat. Having this political rhetoric has impl implications uh, for the, 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 the policies we are seeing uh, in, in, in these countries. So in my view, economic and political factors did play a role and they will probably keep uh, playing a role. We, we could see also like countries opening towards other countries during the summer because of tourism. And I'm not saying that's not a like a, a, a like a very important argument because tourism is a very, very important uh, part of, of our economies, especially for some countries in Europe. In this sense, countries did give a priority to economic and political factors. Uh, another question in the chat is whether um, the World Health Organization what in, wants international cooperation to deal with, uh, with COVID. Were they happy with individual national responses uh, and whether, um, whether the, the World uh, Health Organization advice treated seriously? Well, the truth is that although the advice of the World Health Organization wasn't like a, a, probably a headline in the news, uh, the, the recommendations from the very beginning were that borders shouldn't be closed and uh, 
we should uh, work towards uh, international cooperation. Again, I'm not saying that the decision of European states in the beginning of the pandemic to close their borders was like a, a horrific mistake. This was an emergency response, right? When we are in a state of panic, when we, we don't know what to do, we needed an emergency response. And this was the choice that, that governments made. Uh, but now we do have the tools and we have the time to reflect on, on this policy and, and decide whether we need it in future and uh, like outgoing and future outbreaks or not. In this sense, I would make a distinction between the framework and the framing coming from the World Health Organization and the one coming from national governments. And I would say that they, they really differed uh, in, in the first months. Um, another question is whether we won't uh, consider the bo border closure first implemented by countries in the region, rather a political test of EU attempt to change in mindsets of citizens. Um, well, that's an interesting question. And again, it points to, I would say, the political rhetoric and the, the choice of, of, of policy makers how to frame the threat, right? Whether it's like, uh, it's, it's whether the audience of, for, for their messages was um, the local population uh, of, a, of, a, of a country or whether it's like the audience which is at EU level and basically the dialogue with, with the European Union. Um, I will be also happy to, uh, to respond to more questions. So please um, uh, keep writing us and of course to give back the floor to, to Cameron. You know, it's a very like uh, it's a very interesting uh, conversation, and it's a super difficult one. Like you're saying, you know, there is the role for the states; they need to be there for you know initial responses, you know, but also this is precisely that initial response which created the problems that they're now dealing with, um, in a way. So it all it sometimes it somehow feels like a bit like you can't really um, get ahead in some. It, it, it's like a paradox in a bit. The whole situation. Um, so I think like what, you know, one thing that's, I have felt with this whole situation and, you know, building off of what you've said is that the pandemic is already, is accelerating things that are already, were already in motion before. And I think already in motion before were some real serious reconsiderations of borders and sovereignty. You know, we see that, you know, primarily through the strong re reaction of nationalists and populists, you know, trying to reassert the importance of these importance of these identities and borders. So, how do you like? What do you think uh, might come out of long term in terms of thinking about borders and sovereignty? Maybe not in practice, or or unless that's what, how you want to answer. But it just um, what do you see as potentially long term sort of effects on borders and sovereignty of the pandemic? It's a very, super interesting how things will play out in 10, 20 years. How we might look back. Um, I would like to point to one uh, research that one of the speakers um, presented in, in, in uh, the previous panel, and also I think I'm quoting this research in, in the paper. It's, uh, it's a poll about, uh, among nine European countries and the citizens of nine Euro European countries, whether they believe that in the midterm um, and long term border restrictions should be tougher, let's say. To, um, to, to, to provide us with, uh, with security against um, whether COVID or other type, types of threats. And at the first glance, it seems that there is a very like a significant support among European citizens for reintroducing uh, some uh, more serious border, border control. Uh, However, and like, of course, we can, we can say that uh, this agenda can be easily adopted by, by politicians and movements with more nationalistic rhetoric and to see the, 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 the growth of, of this type of, of, of narratives. However, I would say that this is the effect of the panic. This is the effect, the effect of the fear that we have experienced. And I... I would um, also point to another part of this research showing that the, the vast majority of European citizens remain uh, 
uh, proponents of, of uh, the freedom of movement across the European Union, which means that we are not, not ready to abandon uh, the values that we have. We are not ready to uh, sacrifice uh, what we have built already across the European Union. However, the, the fear, the, the, the momentum that we experience now uh, make us reconsider the way we think of like concepts like borders and, and security. Um, it, in this sense, I, I cannot predict what will be the conversation 10 years from now, but I'm hopeful that people are not ready to uh, abandon, again, the values that we've built in Europe uh, just to, uh, to basically restrict uh, what we have for the sake of like creating some fake or let's say artificial wall because invisible threats are the topic of, um, of, of, of the forum today um, are really not easy to be stopped by borders, by physical borders. And I would um, probably stop here because I, I see that uh, uh, we have um, reached the end of, of, of uh, this workshop. Thank you, Cameron for your questions and thank you everyone for, um, uh, for sharing your questions and thoughts. And I would like to use the opportunity to invite you to the next panel um, that starts at 2.15. So you have some 15 minutes, please reconnect or just stay connected. And uh, what we are going to talk about, not only with Cameron, but with two more speakers, very distinguished guests. We are going to talk about the post-pandemic order and what we can expect in terms of technology, humanity, and relationship between citizens and governments. See you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.